Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Society of American Military Engineers, I would like you to welcome you to today's webinar on advances in stormwater. I'm Rick Cox, Vice President at BMT Designers and Planners, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I also serve as chair of the Environmental Committee for SAMI, who is hosting this webinar. A little bit of a plug about the Environmental Committee. Our mission is to create value to our membership through educational opportunities such as this, professional forums, outreach, and business programs. The Environmental Committee is focused on the collaboration of SAMI members and government staff working on government issues and environmental issues. If you're a member of SAMI and interested in participating in the Environmental Committee, you may join by following the instructions on our webpage at sami.org slash environmental, and you're also welcome to follow us on LinkedIn. Today's webinar would not be possible without the great efforts of Tim Fitzpatrick from SGS Access Laboratories, who leads the Environmental Committee's webinar and education programs. Additionally, I'd like to mention Elizabeth Grauzo from Michael Baker International for her efforts in organizing this webinar and, and being a driving force behind it. We have many people registered for this event. Nearly 80 of you are participating. You, as a reminder, you can type questions in the WebEx Q&A chat box. We will answer as many questions as time allows during the webinar. After this webinar, you will be routed to a survey page. Please participate in this short poll so that we may implement improvements based on your feedback on future webinars. Our first speakers are Elizabeth Krausel and David Kottnor, who will discuss cleaning the bay the Navy way. Mr. David Kottnor is a senior water program manager at NAFAC Mid-Atlantic working in the environmental business line. He is a professional engineer in Virginia and has managed stormwater projects for NAFAC at Navy and Marine Corps installations for more than 25 years in Virginia, North Carolina, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, and Iceland. He has authored and co-authored several articles published in professional journals and is regarded as one of the Navy's top experts for stormwater regulatory issues. He has provided support on development of Navy policy regarding low impact development as well as ESA, Energy and Independent Security Act, Section 438. He was awarded NAFAC Mid-Atlantic's 2011 Civilian Engineer of the Year. Additionally, co-presenting with David Cottonor is Elizabeth Krausel, who is a professional engineer in Virginia with over 25 years of experience in environmental and water resource engineering. She is an associate vice president at Michael Baker International, where she serves as surface water group manager and program manager in the Alexandria, Virginia office. She has a broad range of experience, including compliance, sustainability, regulatory, permitting, stormwater, watershed assessments, waste load allocations, public outreach, erosion and sedimentation control plans, strong, and stormwater utilities. She is an active member of SAMI and the Water and Environmental Federation. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Crossell. Thank you so much, Rick, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for participating in this webinar. Dave and I are happy to be presenting on Cleaning the Bay the Navy Way, more specifically, presenting information on the innovation developed to overcome NAFAC Mid-Atlantic's challenges on compliance with the Chesapeake Bay TMDL requirements. So I'm going to open the presentation and cover most of the slides, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dave on occasion to cover some of the aspects that are covered internally by NAFAC Mid-Atlantic's program. So our presentation today includes some background, including information on why the various projects were completed, and then dive into some specific examples of innovation to address the various permit challenges, including the regional stormwater permit, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, and stormwater BMP inspections and tracking. So as many of you already know, the Chesapeake Bay is one of our most treasured estuaries, but it is not meeting water quality standards. There are issues with dissolved oxygen, excessive algae, and poor water clarity. Because of this, a pollution diet was developed in the form of a total maximum daily load, or TMDL. The pollutants of concern included the nutrients nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as sediment. This map illustrates the extent of the Bay watershed extending all the way up from New York down to Virginia and the Hampton Roads, Virginia area where these Navy installations are. This table illustrates how the pollute 
tent diets were allocated to the various jurisdictions contributing pollutants to the Bay. But note that the focus of our presentation is on the Navy installations in the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. So starting with the permit challenges with the regional MS-4 permit. The first challenge that we thought the Navy was facing relates to their regional stormwater permit, which covers eight installations spread out in the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. In addition to the obvious geographical coordination challenges, stormwater challenges included the tidal influences, constraints in available land for best management practices, the high water table, and especially restrictions on certain types of BMPs that could be used because of the bash or bird hazard restrictions. Essentially, you cannot have any water features with stormwater BMPs that attract birds near flight lines due to the associated hazards. And I suspect that some of the Air Force participants on this webinar are very familiar with this constraint. Now I'd like to quickly review highlights of the various minimum control measures of their stormwater permit. For the first two, which address public education and outreach, MAPAC Mid-Atlantic had to address three high priority issues for communication. And these included construction site issues, household hazardous waste, and the nutrients associated with the Chesapeake Bay requirements. Because of this, Baker worked really closely with the Navy to develop tailored outreach materials to address these issues. We even developed a logo to brand their stormwater program and the associated messages and posters and various trifle brochures. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dave to talk about some of the programs that are handled internally, such as their IDDE program and minimum control measure number three. So Dave? Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, MCM3, discharge detection elimination. Uh, one of the key aspects of that program is um, you're required to have um, accurate maps of your entire drainage system. So for us, you know, we have eight installations covered by this regional MS4 permit, and six of those also hold industrial stormwater permits. So we had a pretty good head start on the on the mapping, at least at those six installations. And then we went ahead and, and mapped the additional um, two installations. So those maps are complete, and you know they have to have the outfalls, the drainage boundaries, the receiving waters, and then associated impaired waters and um, TMDLs. Um, as far as the program goes, you know we're kind of trying to address the list of discharges through public education and then through systematic inspection of the of the system. You know, which consists of you know dry weather flow observations at the outfalls on an annual basis, and then periodically um, um, removing individual um, stormwater st uh, structure covers to to look for illicit discharges, and we and we try to do that every five years or so. Next, next slide. Uh, construction site runoff control is the next minimum control measure. Um, you know, prior to getting this latest permit, we were just kind of doing spot checks on the construction sites because in Virginia, the um, contractors are holding the stormwater construction permits. But with the, the issuance of this permit in 2013, we essentially had to inspect as the MS4 permit holder at the same frequency as the um, contractors working the construction site. So that was a, a huge <laughs> increased burden for us. Um, so we had to actually go out with a separate contract uh, for that and, and develop a nice uh, database and inspection program to where we can track these inspections that are done and then uh, the data feeds into our annual report as far as how much acreage is disturbed, how many projects per year, and, and so forth. So we're actually running about 1,200 inspections a, a year of our construction sites, so it's a pretty pretty hefty program when you're talking about um, all the construction greater than an acre on eight installations. Next slide. Um, next one, these additional runoff policies, they, they kind of start to bleed over into MCM5, post-construction stormwater management. In November 2007, we had the Navy Low Impact Development Policy, which required projects of a certain size to um, implement uh, low-impact development practices. 
then shortly after that, we had ESA Section 438, which requires um, maintaining um, hydrology on the site for projects greater than 5,000 square feet. And then um, the executive order in 2009, which essentially just imp implements uh, Section 438 and the, and the guidance that EPA developed um, with some input from, from DOD. Uh, then you have the uh, Unified Facilities Criteria Lid Manual. That's, that's basically saying um, look at the, uh, on an individual site, look at the requirements from the lid policy, look at the requirements from ESA Section 30, 438, and then look at the requirements from state stormwater regulations, which in Virginia that's the VSMP program, and basically designed to the governing uh, of the three, the most stringent. So that's uh, pretty much how we handle uh, post-construction stormwater management design. So I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Dave. So for the post-construction runoff control, their MS4 permit required that the Navy keep track of all of their stormwater BMPs. They had an existing spreadsheet that they were maintaining, but the permit required that they add a lot more fields and attributes and data, and this prompted the Navy to want a BMP tracking database that I'm going to discuss in more detail later in the presentation. For the final MCM, good housekeeping, the Navy was in good shape since, as Dave previously mentioned, six of these eight installations already had industrial stormwater permits and the Associated Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plans, or SWEPs. However, the permit required that they also identify high-priority municipal areas in addition to these industrial areas and prepare municipal SWEPs for these areas. So in addition to helping the Navy with their SWEPs for both the industrial and the municipal, in developing the stormwater management plan for the MS4 permit, Baker helped them with determining cost and resource estimates needed for the five-year permit cycle. And now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the biggest challenge, which is, of course, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Uh, this slide just illustrates the cover of our report. Um, we had a lot of different guidance documents that we needed to follow from DEQ. One of these was addressing the MS4 permit and another one addressing the Chesapeake Bay TMDL action plan, which as you can see from this, on this slide needed to be updated. Um, it was originally in August of 2014, 2014 and then updated in May of 2015 just because there were so many outstanding questions and clarifications that were needed. So this graphic illustrates that the first permit cycle required a 5% reduction in the pollutant loadings. Then the second permit cycle added an additional 35%, given a total of 40. And then the third permit cycle will require an additional 60%. So overall, after the base loading has been established or was established, the permit cycles will require 100% loading reductions in three phases. So to start on this effort, Baker initiated the opportunity assessment phase of this, of this effort, which started out with a simple desktop assessment using available data to identify potential stormwater BMPs to reduce pollutant loading across the various installations. Then we completed a more detailed field assessment to verify all the information in our desk assessment. And it was kind of at this point that we realized um, that you need to be careful with your initial opportunity assessment in the desktop phase because the data may not be up to date. And when you're in the office, you might think, well, this is a great location, but then when you get out in the field, you could find conditions that are much different than the data. After that step, we worked on improving the Navy's BMP prioritization system. This was so that their efforts would focus their limited funding on the project with the highest return on investment. Categories included and the order of their percentage impact included, number one, environmental benefits, two, environmental impact factors, three, constraints, and four, the relative BMP factors. 
then with all the finalized BMPs, we developed a really nice system to help the Navy compare and contrast hundreds of BMPs. As you can see on the screen, we have these opportunity information sheets. On the left-hand side, it shows the map with all of the information about the location, and then on the right-hand side is the fact sheet that has information about the opportunity, a description of the site solution, and then all of those prioritization metrics. Um, and then also, of course, the pictures. So we had hundreds and hundreds of these prepared for the Navy. We're currently working on the conceptual design and DD Form 1391s for over 100 stormwater BMPs in the Hampton Roads area. The, this is, on the screen, an example of a conceptual design for a dry swale. Once the BMPs were identified, we needed to estimate the associated pollutant loading reductions using three different guidance documents. One is the Virginia Stormwater BMP Clearinghouse, the next retrofit performance curves provided by the Chesapeake Bay Program, and then finally approved or interim Chesapeake Bay Program efficiencies. Baker also developed an ArcGIS tool to assist with the calculations of the pollutant load reductions for the various BMPs. So now we have a slide that kind of goes over the status of the current pollutant loading and reductions based on projected BMP designs. And I'm going to turn it over to Dave to talk about this in more detail. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, so looking at the, the slide, you kind of have the three um, three benchmark lines there, the 5%, which was for the first permit cycle, which actually ends next June. Um, the second line is for the second permit cycle, and you know, as Elizabeth had said, it was 5, 35, and 60. So this is just showing cumulatively these lines, 5% reduction after the first permit cycle, 40% after the second, and then 100% of our required reductions have to be accomplished by 2028. So the good news is when we did the action plan, um, it showed that we had already met the 5% um, reduction that was required for, for all three pollutants of concern um, for the first permit cycle. So we're kind of ahead of schedule just with the credit we were able to obtain for the existing BMPs that had been implemented um, since 2006. Now moving forward into this next permit cycle ending in 2023 though, uh, we have a, a lot of work to do and Elizabeth mentioned the conceptual designs that we had contracted for um, they've actually prepared almost 200 uh, site conceptual designs for us, and the, on the right-hand side, that, that kind of shows where we would stand after implementing those almost 200 designs. So even with all those BMPs, we're, we're not quite going to be there by 2023, so uh, we, we need to actually do some additional conceptual designs, but more importantly, that means we need to build 200 to probably 220 to 250 um, BMPs to, um, to meet these required load reductions by the end of 2023. Um, we have a project pending to look at some more innovative um, BMPs and some things that, you know, maybe give you some larger reductions with uh, smaller footprints, some of the some of the things like um, stream restoration and uh, shoreline stabilization that would maybe reduce our you know, cost per pound in some cases, but no matter how you look at it, it's going to be a, an expensive um, proposition. Yes, Dave, thanks. And I guess another point that's important to make here is that all the best BMPs relative to bang for your buck, we have worked on those. So we are kind of approaching diminishing returns with the traditional BMPs that we've been looking at. So we really need to think outside of the box and look at some of these non-traditional BMPs to try to maximize our efficiency with pollutant loading. So now for the final permit challenge phase is with the BMP inspection requirements. 
So the Navy is faced with having to do these annual inspections of over 300 BMPs across the various Hampton Roads installations. This slide illustrates examples of BMPs that got a satisfactory result in their inspection, an unsatisfactory inspection, and a satisfactory BMP. Um, <clears throat> but this is one that satisfactory with notes means a BMP that isn't totally unsatisfactory, but just needs some minor attention. Like in this one, it just needs some more vegetation around um, in the area. <laughs> but I always have to laugh when I see this one unsatisfactory where it looks like somebody has just driven over the BMP. And I'm sure that many of you on the phone, a lot of the stormwater managers have experienced similar frustrations with us. So to assist with this tremendous effort of tracking the inspections, Baker developed a BMP tracking database. This took their existing spreadsheet database and pulled into access with a user-friendly interface. The database is loaded onto field laptops so that information can be entered into directly in the field on the spot. So that reduces the potential errors of, of translating the information from the field forms to the database. Uh, as well as just makes it a lot more efficient. So this graphic illustrates the main interface of the tool. You see it has a really lot of information that I won't get into all these excruciating details with you. Uh, so the next slide actually zooms in at a closer look at the primary toolbar. Uh, so it shows you how you can look for a particular BMP at a particular installation how you can open up a new inspection form for a new BMP. And then one cool feature is that we included a Google, Google Maps tool that functions really of use in the field if the inspector isn't sure that they're at the correct BMP, especially when you have numerous BMPs located real close to each other. So now to get to the summary and highlights, um, we branded their stormwater program by creating a logo and templates for their stormwater outreach messaging. We developed a streamlined methodology for efficiently identifying and ranking stormwater BMPs. We created a pollutant load reduction GIS tool to assist with the pollutant load reduction credits. And then finally, developed an access database tool to assist with the tracking and inspections and maintenance of hundreds of stormwater BMPs. So thanks again so much for participating in the webinar. A special thanks here to James Kelly with Baker, who's the technical lead and manager for most of this work. And of course, all the other Baker employees who contributed to, this, to these various projects in the past and who are working on the projects currently. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Rick? Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, David. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, you can use the chat box. I'm monitoring that right now. Uh, we've got one. Uh, and I'll go ahead and uh, attribute it. It looks like Don Hottenroth is asking, is the Navy exploring par or participating in nutrient and exchange programs that might be available in Virginia? David? Uh, yeah, this is Dave. Um, right now, uh, we haven't gotten clearance from <laughs> legal to uh, actually participate in trading outside of DOD. Um, with this regional permit, we have the ability to essentially have an aggregate load amongst these eight installations and therefore kind of trade in, in and amongst the installations. But as far as um, outside purchases or exchanges, um, legal is looking into that because you have to have special legislation to allow that um, on the federal level. And they, they have that for like wetlands mitigation and so forth and wetlands banking, but they don't have it for stormwater uh, pollutant credit trading. Okay, thanks. So let me ask you a question uh, for both of you. Uh, what aspects, and maybe you both give the same answer, but what aspect of a proposed BMP had the greatest impact on us being ranked here? Dave, did you want to start us answering that, or would you like me to give it a shot? I can do it. I mean, if the, if the 
go back to the slide on uh, the, with the pie chart, you can kind of see, but it's mostly driven by the environmental improvement factors. So, you know, we, we had the impact factors, which is, you know, how much of a problem is the site? How much, how much pollution is occurring there? How much, you know, impervious area? Are there industrial um, activities present? Um, things like that, you know, visible erosion and so forth. Yeah, this is a slide. But then under environmental benefits, when we look at the BMPs that are being uh, proposed or evaluated, a big driver of that score is the efficiency of the BMPs. So, you know, the, the, the single biggest driver, there are a few other questions in there, um, but the biggest thing is the efficiency both from a um, pollutant removal standpoint and a runoff reduction standpoint. So we kind of look at both water quality and water quantity and, um, you know, through, through both of those. So it's, um, you know, if, if it's sites where we can put the high efficiency BMPs like bioretention or whatever, they're going to, in general, score higher because we're getting a higher pollutant removal efficiency, which is driving the scores higher. And when we add all these scores up, we, we rank these BMPs against one another and compare them. Right. Uh, there was a slide that, sh go ahead. I can go add ahead. a little bit more information to that, Dave. So as, as presented on this pie chart, the environmental benefits was 43% and the relative BMP cost factors was 13%. But when I look in those individual subcategories of each one of those, the two highest percentage-wise was the water quality crediting score at 27% within the environmental benefits, and then the cost estimate per unit drainage area within the relative BMP cost factors at 10%. So those, out of these, when you break them down into the smaller components, those were the two that had the most influence on the scoring. Thanks. So there was a question regarding implementation of the BMPs and funding. Is it managed by the base? Uh, I think I understand the context of the question because Hampton Roads has, you showed a lot of different bases within the region. So uh, how is that being managed uh, in, in addressing all of the bases? Uh, are, are all of them participating or just a single decision maker here. Well, right now the, um, the the funding has been identified and requested at, at the regional level where I sit, so that that regional level kind of covers all of these bases. Um, <laughs> in addition to an installation we have in the in the watershed up in Pennsylvania at Mechanicsburg, so the funding has been requested for the construction of the BMPs at this base, at, at these bases. Um, none of it has been granted in Virginia because, you know, until 2018 we've essentially exceeded the required goal. So we're, we're trying to get funding, you know, for this next permit cycle. In um, Pennsylvania and Mechanicsburg, um, we were able to obtain some funding and implement some BMPs up there, so there have been some that have been constructed already. Okay, and what's going to be the penalty for not making your reduction target by 2023? If we don't uh, meet the reduction target, you know, we will be, you know, essentially, you know, subject to enforcement action, you know, from from the state, you know. So we're, you know, under the permit, it's essentially going to be a permit condition to comply with your action plan. So. Right now, you know, our, the, the action plan that we did in 2014 and 2015 only covered the first permit cycle and we had essentially met the goal. When we do the action plan for the next permit cycle, it'll then become an enforceable part of the permit and if it's not implemented, you know, we could be subject to enforcement. And, and describe the political or the regulatory environment that you're working in. So when you say enforcement, if you're not meeting what, um, you know, Virginia is kind of military friendly state. So what other possible enforcement actions that could be taken here? 
Well, enforcement is, you know, usually starts with a notice of violation. Um, if you are, you, know, you could get repetitive enforcement uh, um, violations, which eventually leads you to having to negotiate some type of consent order or consent agreement to actually, you know, implement the required measures by a, by a certain date. So that would kind of be, I guess, the the gradual escalation of starting with, you know, possibly a warning letter or more than likely, a, you know, an NOV and then potentially multiple NOVs leading to a, you know, a consent decree or something like that. Okay. And then the final question before we go to the next speaker is uh, what's the approximate operating cost for your MS4 program? Oh, man. <laughs> Total MS4 program that that would be difficult. I, I would say that at least um, in the past five years, um, developing all these um, different tools and doing these inventories and doing the additional mapping that wasn't covered by the industrial program. I mean, we've I think we've probably spent over two million dollars. Thank you, Dave. Let me ask one more question, because uh, when President Trump came into office, uh, people in the environmental industry started getting concerned and worried, uh, especially when he took uh, they took the action and they stopped all the environmental re uh, regulations at EPA that hadn't been published on Federal Register and then the, the White House uh, Chief of Staff memo that came out. Uh, and, and Trump is pretty much, you know, pro-business and uh, doesn't want environmental regulations. Dave, in your opinion, you know, what has changed since since the January memo? Are you seeing a greater sense of uh, importance in funding, or is it pretty much status quo? Uh, you know, there's there a, a lot of pending regulations have been delayed, but as far as, uh, you know, funding levels, from our program and where we sit, we haven't seen a change. Of course, you know, the president has um, promised to, and, and it looks like, you know, the promise is going to be delivered to increase funding to the military, but I don't know that the military environmental program will get any bigger. They'll, you know, just build uh, more ships and planes and stuff. But, um, but uh, we definitely haven't, you know, really seen a, a significant funding increase or decrease. So, so far in the environmental program. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you for your questions. Uh, feel free to keep asking. I'll track them, and we may have time uh, at the end of the session to ask a few questions. So if you do submit a question so that we keep track of it, uh, please reference the speaker and the presentation because we're going to start with our second presentation. Our next speaker is Mr. Neil Weinstein, who is Executive Director at the Low Impact Development Center. Neil has over 30 years of experience working on stormwater management and infrastructure projects throughout the U.S. and internationally. He has spent the last 20 years with the Low Impact Development Center working on sustainable stormwater solutions. And a significant amount of his work has been for DOD and federal agencies on policy, research, pilot projects, and training on low impact development. He is currently working with the Clean Water Partnership on the Prince George's County, Maryland Stormwater Public-Private Partnership which is one of the largest stormwater programs in the U.S. Neil? Thank you very much. I'm on speakerphone. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, I'd like to uh, begin with saying that uh, the center is, we've been around about 20 years now, and uh, our first projects were actually with the Navy, and we're still doing pilot projects And um, uh, after 20 years, and we're going to hear about some of those from um, Spaywars, and we've been involved in manuals of practice, uh, guidance manuals, demonstration projects, and um, uh, actually worked on the first UFC. So today's uh, presentation, I'd like to talk about uh, one is the context of the retrofits that we're doing, some of the challenges and opportunities, some new tools and approaches, and how to move up uh, to the watershed. You, you had a couple questions there on the trading and. Maybe we can move things along a little bit in there. So uh, everybody in stormwater now should be um, pretty busy building BMPs. Um, it's a challenging time. We're putting in lots of uh, devices 
uh, lots of BMPs, and um, there are all kinds of um, considerations uh, that we're kind of working on. So we really kind of can look at this as having two kind of toolboxes. One um, centralized, such as ponds and then the pipe systems, and the other is decentralized, such as uh, environmentally sensitive design, low impact development, and green infrastructure. So I'm going to kind of move towards a little bit northern towards Maryland, in which we have the TMDL guidance manual. So if you're practicing in the state, um, you can see there's guidance looking really focused on uh, impervious acre credit through equivalencies or through directly providing volume for treatment, and then um, looking at efficiency of uh, removal of BMPs. So when we look, uh, we talked a little bit about what's the most effective practices. Um, and working with Prince George's County and also the Clean Water Partnership, we've been involved in uh, this last year over about 150 projects looking at retrofits. And um, probably the biggest uh, bang for your buck is to, according to the TMDL guidance and, and the permits, is really going back towards uh, uh, modifying uh, centralized uh, controls such as ponds. And here's just on the right some pictures of some ponds without four bays, and you can see um, we have a lot of nutrients and sediment uh, accumulating. So we've gone back and uh, had designs where we're actually providing more volume, more storage volume, and then uh, putting in four bays and planting around the edges um, to achieve the volume and also uh, the work quality. And then, uh, and, and Dave had mentioned before a little bit about stream restoration uh, and stabilization is another um, technique. And then finally, um, storm drain outfalls. So I, I think you could look at any installation or any base and um, you can find a graded storm drain outfall. And so that's one of our um, programs that we're involved in one is um, because there are thousands of them, tens of thousands of them probably throughout the Bay. Um, even though we don't get nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, TSS removal credit, um, we can still get impervious acre equivalencies for that for right now. And then on the other side, um, we have uh, uh, things like fire retention cells, uh, gra gravel wetlands, or sand filters, which are the decentralized. So I find it kind of interesting is that um, the BMP manuals for new design or retrofit are really geared um, towards these small-scale distributed practices. But when we look at TMDLs, uh, the biggest bang for buck is really such a, uh, linear and uh, pond practices. So one of the things that we have to look at with them is that we only have, also have local TMDLs. So in addition to nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, some jurisdictions uh, have trash TMDLs, PCBs, um, uh, looking at uh, metals. And so we have to do a really better job, I think, as professionals and researchers in looking at the sources and effectiveness. So we can um, have, for example, this on the left is a bioretention cell, which is probably sized properly, but the inlet isn't sized big enough to let the water get in. So when we look at it, we're not really capturing and, and really being that effective. Or in many cases, we just have storm drain systems. Um, you can see here on the right uh, that are so totally filled with trash or debris and are not being cleaned regularly um, that we um, don't have systems that work very well. And we can actually get credit for um, storm drain system cleaning. I always like this picture of somebody threw a bottle of beer away, which is a, a, a crime. Um, and so um, we look at our BMPs that we're using now in our BMP suite, and uh, we're supposed to be having post-construction BMPs. So here's a picture of a entrance to a bioretention cell at um, uh, in an industrial, an industrial or a storage complex. And you can see here um, in the lower right the amount of sediment that is accumulating, just the street dirt, grit, uh, any materials that come off um, uh, storage areas. And uh, so if you looked at this BMP and you said uh, you had to maintain it uh, twice a year, 
uh, you would have, probably have a, a pile of sediment about 10 feet high. So we have to be really cognizant and more careful about our maintenance cycles because we just can't really look at things off the shelf. And then um, the alternative you can see here this is a clean site, and I don't I don't think they keep that backhoe there all day to clean that out. But you can see we have to really match the maintenance cycle up to a load, and I think that's part of what we're doing is as we start to develop asset management systems for these BMPs. So one of the big challenges that we have, especially with things like bioretention or bioswales or um, stormwater ponds, is uh, the amount of grit and sediment that comes off roadways and parking areas. You can see here on the left, uh, the traditional way we've been doing it is um, putting in really some riprap or some small riprap or rocks or stone to trap fine-grained sediments, or sometimes we may even put a small, um, a, a small weir or a small pretreatment uh, cell. But what's happening is because of our space considerations here, you can see on the lower left is in Montgomery County, Maryland, a backless inlet where they have um, they have perforations in the back of this weir to let the water and sediment, and it gets trapped pretty much in the inlet and can be easily swept out or sucked out with a back truck or a proprietary device. So we, we have things that kind of move away from our traditional standards but can actually be more uh, effective in removing of, um, of pollutants and, and making our devices more efficient. One of the things that uh, just came off the presses from the Bay program is uh, recommendations on performance enhancing devices. So we have uh, universities, one, we work with the University of Maryland quite a bit, and uh, uh, there's a lot of research in the Bay program out of Villanova out of the UVA, and uh, I, don't, I don't mean to leave anybody out here, um, where we're looking at increased performance. So one of the things that we look at, and if you're doing work in the state of Maryland, you see the runoff production and the performance removal curves, is about a 10% increase uh, in removal of um, phosphorus. But um, one of the issues with that is that we often don't understand in our BMPs um, how the loads are, and, and we showed some slides before about the conditions coming in. We seem to be always reporting on going out. So the upper left is the international, some slides off of the international BMP database. And you can see data is kind of all over the place. And, and the BMP database, uh, the ASC BMP database is a really good tool, and uh, if you're designing BMPs, you should be familiar with it. And on the lower right is the project that Bob Pitt and Carol worked on, and it's looking at source characterization. So once we understand really the types of pollutants that are coming off uh, our land uses, and you can see it's a really good fit of data, we can address the right technology. And that's, that's one of the key things, especially in local TMDLs that we have to be worried about. And here's a project in Maryland, for example, the university, and this was a, one of those thunderstorms that occurred just as we were putting it in, you can see up on up the right, is how um, this, this actually BMP is uh, in a series, and we've almost got the loads uh, down to um, minimal loads, like almost 80, 90% reduction in phosphorus, nitrogen, and TSS, and uh, metals uh, that were in there below drinking water standards. So what we're doing is, is really important for funding, especially through grants or pilot projects, that people keep going, keep feeding this into the system to influence the design. So some kind of lessons learned and, and some tools that we look at in low impact development, design, and construction. Um, first is, you know, we, we have to get away from just looking at standards, all the details all the time, just copying them over. You can see here, uh, up on the upper right, it's a saturated bioretention cell, and it's probably a selection of not having an underdrain or poor media. Or on the lower right is uh, plants uh, that are supposed to be planted here and just didn't make it. And, and it's important that we um, work on those types of issues. And then finally, materials. So we can have a lot of these new materials. Um, that we look at, for example, permeable pavements. We have permeable concrete, permeable concrete blocks, 
and permeable asphalt. And um, I'm actually working on a committee right now. It's been uh, about three years of work so far. We're coming up with an AFCE standard on um, permeable interlocking concrete pavers. And uh, it'll be the first national standard. It's about 150 pages long. But it's very comprehensive. And, and this is something that people always need to hang their hat on and understand in the design process. Um, and here's just a, a flow chart of how we look at the structural and the hydrologic analysis through these pavement systems. But then we also have other products. This is uh, ACF. This is a group that I work with sometimes out of uh, Virginia on products. And um, you can see here, we used to have these little plastic rings. And now here we have a, a system, a permeable pavement system with a very strong structural components and cells that we can use for storage and infiltration and uh, much more resilient and, uh, and forgiving to site conditions. Uh, and so talking about resiliency, I always like this picture because uh, one is this is uh, down at the Navy Yard, a uh, fire retention cell we put in 20 some years ago when it first came in. And the slide on the right is uh, uh, during a, a, a drought one summer after about five years that was in there and was a, a brutal 90 some degrees, uh, which is about 10 degrees uh, cooler than we have now, is that um, we really have to start understanding uh, the plants and the soils mix uh, that we're using in these systems. And uh, ASCE has just formed a new committee under the LID, uh, new task committee under the LID committee to look at this, and we're going to play partner with ASLA. So we're, that body of knowledge is kind of moving along. Uh, one other thing we looked at is here's a, another system is the cost of uh, construction is um, a, another proprietary system. And what this system is, it's uh, fire retention with a high flow media. And essentially it reduces your footprint by about, um, down to about a quarter of the size. So, and to get the equivalent water quality treatment. So on the side, for example, on the right, upper right is a swale a traditional bioswale, and on the left is a proprietary system. So what's important about this is um, these systems is that, and here's another slide just showing a bioretention cell uh, with the high flow media in it, or uh, another focal point is that when we look at retrofit, one of the costs that we have is the expense of hauling materials off and on. So if you can make something uh, about a quarter of the size, um, when we look at that, uh, that can be quite a substantial savings, especially when we're looking at retrofitting large areas and we start to talk about hundreds of um, installations of bioretention or bioswales. So the proprietary, there is a place for proprietary products, um, I think, in addition to our uh, generic standards and specifications. I'd like to kind of move to some more specific and more targeted uh, pollutants. One is uh, I'd like to mention, uh, if you look to the NSBE website, uh, there's probably about a dozen, maybe two dozen uh, stormwater studies and reports that are really essential reading for people in stormwater. And uh, this is a project we just finished up at Exwick, and um, it looks at LID in industrial areas. So what we wanted to do is look into the unique kind of characteristics of industrial facilities and installations and um, see if we could use uh, decision support systems. So what's, what's good about this is when you have a specific pollutant load, like a TMDL for metals, uh, copper, zinc, lead, uh, we can kind of go through a process to um, look at and select the correct DMPs. So one of the nice things about this is there's a very comprehensive literature review on industrial type stormwater pollutants that would be great. Uh, I think you should uh, have a chance to kind of load that up, and it'll give you a basic understanding as well as very in-depth uh, understanding of some of the pollutants. And it includes a technology description of the different types of BMPs and how they function and how it can be monitored and modeled. And so, for example, in there, um, we could find things, um, you know, oftentimes we look at uh, source control. So this uh, stack of uh, um, copper treated, uh, treated pressure treated wood uh, probably has almost as much as a building. And so it's important to isolate or have treatment 
or, or look at how we're really operating um, uh, many of our uh, installations. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing the uh, slide for a second. There we go. And so uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is make advances to having sources uh, and the type of treatment and, and understanding that bioretention cell does certain uh, um, physical, chemical, biological processes to remove pollutants and just as something on media filter or permeable pavement. And so we have to understand how these things uh, function. And the, the manual includes case studies and uh, different locations and schematics to help you make it a little bit easier in, in um, uh, following and, host, and, um, and designing some sites. And then um, one of the things I'd like to talk about that we've been working on is, and we have a couple pilots around the Bay, is looking at a, a technology we developed with the University of Maryland to do filtering. Uh, we call it LIDMAT and uh, LIDMIX, and uh, what, what it is essentially it's a high rate filter in a geotech style or just the media uh, to look at metals removals. And we have some uh, pilots going around, like I said, and uh, some full scale implementations out and through some of the coastal areas. So the good thing about this technology is it's small, it's lightweight, deployable, and um, it can be retrofit. And that, that's the problem, we have so many legacy systems, we have to figure a way to make them operate more efficiently. So we have a, a lot of new tools, we have a lot of new research, and then um, how to apply these on the watershed level. So one thing that I think is a really good tool, and this is all set up for the Bay Region, if you type in the uh, watershed resources registry um, on your internet, uh, on your browser, you find this joint project between EPA, uh, DOD, Army, uh, Fish and Wildlife, and all the regulatory agencies. And this lets you look at areas that are suitable for um, watershed uh, restoration. So when we talked about looking at we can't fit something into an existing area, where are the next places in the watershed that we can have an impact? Uh, we also just finished a project, and this is available on the web, and it looks at watershed-based uh, stormwater management for uh, departments of transportation. And what we did with that is not only looking at BMPs to address the basics, TSS, nitrogen, and phosphorus, but look at ecosystem services, because in many cases our mitigation plans are going to have to address habitat. And um, this is a spreadsheet tool that's using uh, basic um, uh, basic uh, information readily available. You can It's plugged into source of information from the web. And for example, here this slide shows where we have a project area, um, percent imperviousness, and we can calculate it, one zone continuous simulation, uh, the loads uh, per acre. And then we can, on the other side, kind of calculate the effectiveness of a BMP. And uh, like I said, and then the, so it's, basic calculation and then we can put in some of our goals and uh, we can look at the quantitative and qualitative basis. So this is rolled out and we're going to um, look at doing some pilot projects with some DOTs in the watershed over the next year. Last thing, a couple of projects is uh, I think we're doing this, uh, This um, we talked about this public-private partnership in Prince George's County. I think this first year we were targeting we almost have 100 and some projects under construction, uh, completing almost close to 1,000 acres of uh, retrofits. And part of this is um, kind of a cradle-to-grave operation where we're combining not only um, the designs, but we're, we're using the asset management, we're using the maintenance crews and the maintenance uh, companies that are involved in this to inform the designers. So I think that's is one thing that has kind of been missing over time is that we're doing a lot of design and a lot of construction and often we don't get the back end and get the feedback loop from the asset management. And you can see uh, in the previous how, how we're really moving towards more of that approach. And then finally, just to wrap things up, um, there's some good resources that I think people should take a look at. Uh, very helpful, and, and especially when we start to move towards more of the TMDLs and understanding BMPs. 
uh, National Cooperative Highway Research Program, especially if you're interested in metals, um, water environment and reuse foundation, uh, NSD, uh, Navy's NSD site, uh, the ASC EPA DMP database, and uh, various EPA websites I think can help um, in is uh, develop the toolbox for some of the designs. And with that, that's my um, final slide. All right. Thanks, Neil. Uh, remind everybody, if you have any questions, uh, type them into the chat box. But let me start off with a question. Uh, Neil, what, what are some of the key research topics and challenges for bioretention that you're seeing? Yeah, I think uh, a couple are the um, looking at, at, at um, plants and soils uh, interaction and also the media. I think um, part of it is when we, uh, these are kind of living systems and uh, we haven't really looked at, uh, a lot of times we're treating these as kind of gardens um, in a way and these are most places that we're using, especially on installations, are, are very, um, uh, very utilitarian. And um, so we, we have all these one-off projects where uh, we have a, a one bioretention design and it looks totally different from another. And so when we look to managing these systems, we want to try and find materials that are local and materials that are readily available. Um, so I think that's a, a challenge. I, I think there's a lot of big work being done right now and it's just really starting. All right. There was a question to come in during the first presentation, but I think it applies here because you had, I think slide 25 showed uh, industrial uh, areas and such. And do you have any experience getting funding for low impact development uh, using industrial permit regulatory drivers or when you don't have a regulatory driver in place, uh, specifically in trying to get an LID pro pilot project? Well, I think there are, re depending on the size of the industrial facility, I believe in, in Maryland, there's still a 20% retrofit requirement. I think it's over, don't hold me to it, but it might be over a five-acre site or um, or an acre site. Someone would have to correct me on that. But also, um, stormwater is supposed to be treated uh, from the industrial. You know, if you have an industrial permit, uh, you still have a dis, you know a discharge uh, uh, limit for uh, if you have a specific industrial permit and some of the general ones, where you're going to have to put a BMP anyway. So um, it, it's a compliance issue. Okay. All right. Uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit during your presentation, uh, the challenges for maintenance and life cycle considerations for uh, lid BMPs. Yeah, so with that, I think what's happened is that many of the manuals just really have basic maintenance and uh, this, and I think many of the cycles are, are too long. So what happens is if you maintain something twice a year, it may take you, you know, a half a crew day, and it may take a lot to, you know, remove sediment, maybe a piece of equipment. Uh, whereas if there may be a more frequent cycle, uh, depending on what kind of load you have, um, would help the system operate more efficiently and effectively and, and reduce kind of the war, larger capital costs. Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, again, reminder, anybody have any questions, feel free to type it in and we'll get back to them at the end of the session. At this point, I'm gonna to go to our third session. Our speakers are Dr. Kara Sorensen and Jonathan Rosen from Space and Naval Warfare Systems Center Pacific, also known as Bay War Pacific, who will discuss Navy stormwater research projects. Dr. Sorensen is an environmental toxicologist and research scientist at Spayor Pacific with over 10 years experience in managing projects and conducting research uh, for the Navy and Marine Corps, including Navy Region Southwest, Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, and Office of Naval Research. She has a range of experience, including watershed assessments, estuary monitoring, point non-point source contaminant, monitoring assessment, and evaluation of stormwater management tools. Her primary research and expertise is focused on development of in vitro and real-time tools for both detection and understanding of heat and transport of 
DOD contaminants of concern by incorporating the use of both molecular and microbiology techniques. Uh, Gunter Rosen is an aquatic biologist at Spayward Pacific with research interest in aquatic and sediment ecotoxicology. For almost 20 years, he's been conducting basic and applied research for the Navy in areas of improving management of contaminated discharges and sediments. His research focuses on understanding the bioavailability and toxicity of DOD relevant contaminants and marine systems, and the development, demonstration, and validation of technologies to improve uh, environmental quality assessment. He currently manages Bay Wars interest in the DOD CERTIP and ESTCP programs. Thank you both very much, and I'd like to thank the rest of our speakers for participating, taking time out of their busy schedule, and, and sharing what they're working on. Uh, I'd like to make another plug for the Environmental Committee. You can uh, visit us on sameme.org slash environmental. If you want to reach me directly, Rick Cox, uh, my email address is there. Click on my name or Tim Fitzgerald. If you have an idea on a webinar, uh, we do invite ideas, and this is how this arose. Elizabeth reached out to me. We are planning one for August and another one for September. We're in the early, trying to get it wrapped up on the planning. August will be about writing for better, better proposals, and it looks like September is going to be something about 1,4-dioxane uh, remediation focus, and we're trying to represent the, the full environmental markets and the programs that you may be interested in. So again, uh, feel free to contact me directly, and I look forward to working with you and representing you, and at the same time making the Environmental Committee uh, value added for you and, and you know, your investments and such. So at this point, on behalf of the Society of American Military Engineers and the Environmental Committee, uh, we appreciate your participation. We hope this webinar has been valuable. Uh, and at the same time, you can reach any of the Environmental Committee board members through our webpage. So uh, this concludes our webinar, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you very much.